Hello again, another listener. It's been ages. Perhaps you've forgotten how this podcast is played. Allow me to remind you, this is the Grog Pod Rogue Bike Podcast, wherein each episode we uh, we notice that the weather's changing and we got to uh, dive into the woods to a nice cozy cabin uh, to get away from, from all this spooky fall weather and, uh, and come into this cabin to... to chain ourselves to a desk and review some roguelike games and revisit them at the end of the year for the great transcendence. I am your deranged game master and photography buff, Scott Berger, and with me are my co-hosts conspiring to steal my throne. Uh, It's me, Colin, a uh, man turned into a toad and stuffed into a card. (laughs) And and this is uh, Will. Uh, I'm the most overpowered card in the game, obviously. Hey, uh, I'm a squirrel or something. This is Andrew Harshman. <laughs> uh, hi, this is this is your your guest, the lucky lucky Carter Woody Siskowski. And I gotta I gotta stop you right there because Scott brought up that you guys, which uh, this is like a personality quiz. I want to bring up real quick. Which of the four um, well characters in Inscription are you? Because you, I, I see, I have four cubes sitting on my Zoom screen here, and I'm I feel lucky. like I'm the trapper. I, I feel like. I feel like Will is definitely the supercomputer vibes. Um, oh. He's he's all about the optimal plays. Are you calling him a squarehead? <laughs> I mean, you're 100% you guys right. all actually have pretty angular heads. <laughs> oh, you heard it here first. Yeah, yeah. This is the Coach. hot takes that, that, that Woody guessed on for. Uh, uh, Andrew is well, definitely the scribe of death and or death metal, I would ooh, say. Thank you, okay. thank you. So, Scott, you're stuck as uh, the magic scribe, I guess. Uh, maybe uh, maybe you are the... The the yeah. Christmas tree with the glowing eyeball. Uh, yeah, yes. the weirdest, um, the weirdest character. <laughs> you are you are already half spoiled on the episode uh, that we're talking about today, which is okay. Well, I'm going to stop you again because oh. just when I come in, I just interrupt <laughs> you all the time. That's part of the deal. That's what, what people are here for. You, you you say like half spoiled, but like isn't the name of the episode in the title? Like, That's true. Does anyone, yeah. does anyone like close their eyes and is just like I'm playing the new episode? What's it going to be? Okay, we should we should start out with this though, like. If you are listening to this podcast and no, you haven't Everyone played knows. In, <laughs> and you haven't played Inscription, go. This is heavy spoilers, and the game is better if you don't have no, spoilers. Nobody listens to our podcast. There's no reason for this. <laughs> right. So There's... I'm speaking to the void, and therefore no one will need to heed this warning. There you go. Uh, oh wait, yeah. I have to go. I have to go play this game now. <laughs> I, I was just gonna talk out of my ass for two hours. Yeah, you gotta you gotta like and subscribe first before closing the podcast. Or actually just leave it running so that way we get all the engagement statistics and then you run away to, to go and play it. Um yes, we're playing the haunted house escape room roguelike this week, inscription. Uh <laughs> and as I quickly get through all these boring snap stuff before everyone starts jumping into their their thoughts. Uh, inscription <laughs> released October 19th, 2021, coming up uh, soon on an anniversary. Another find it anywhere kind of game, PC, PlayStation, Xbox, Switch. Uh, this was developed and published by Game Funa. Uh, oh, not have that get in there. Uh, Daniel Mullins Games, <laughs> uh, which he has, uh, or that studio has put out Pony Island and recently Pony Island 2. Uh, Pony has. Island 2 does not exist yet. Well, it's it's it's, it's, it's coming it, soon, I guess. Yeah, that this is. I mean, soon. I think I I got all hyped on inscription, and I went to the website, and they were talking about Pony Island two, and then at the end, it was flashing twenty twenty five, twenty twenty six. Oh my so god! It may be like, a ways in the future. What is Pony Island? Uh oh, uh, it's not what I thought it would be. <laughs> this is terrifying. Have you played Pony Island, Colin? I haven't. Oh, it's 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 worth your time. It's uh, it has a lot of the same uh, neat yeah. things that inscription does, but it's a lot shorter. Uh, but Daniel Mullins has put out, uh, I think, like a dozen other smaller games throughout the ages. Uh, description is published by our good friend Devolver Digital, responsible for Enter the Gungeon, previous episode, Cult of the Lamb, previous episode, Loop Hero, previous episode, <laughs> Downwell, possible episode, uh, and some some other ones that are... Of, of in- all of the hype that uh, y'all were generating before we played this, hype in the form of, like, mystery, like, ooh, don't don't spoil yourself, Andrew. Go in <laughs> totally blind and, oh, prepare to have your mind shattered and blown at the same time. Um, of, of all <laughs> of that hype, uh, the thing that got me equally as hyped was seeing the Devolver splash screen. I'm like, oh, <laughs> they should have told me it was Devolver. <laughs> 
that was the big thing that we were prepping you for. But by, by the way, it's a Devolver game. Uh, inscription rolls in at lucky number 13, 13th most popular roguelike what? game on Steam. Wow, 118,936 total reviews. Uh, your average player of Inscription has about 20 hours in it, according to the data that I pulled. So now, now, okay, this is this is the cutoff point for spoiler territory. You've been like pre-spoiled enough. This is it. We're we're unle we're opening up the gate to the cabin. It is spoiler time now. So hit that pause button if if you're just like blindly listening. Or I want, I want to add a quick little disclaimer here. Uh, if you if you find that your taste in video games is similar to mine, then maybe just disregard this warning and go ahead and enjoy the episode uh spoiler <laughs> spoiler alert for my review uh, but uh yeah otherwise yeah if, if you if you want to all right so you need so, treat uh <laughs> that that gives us the the open open uh platform here for woody to give us the one sentence description of inscription uh before i take his picture and add it to my deck oh perfect all right um uh Postmodern medley of trading card game, creepy pasta roguelike. Yeah, I think the least accurate part of that is roguelike. Yes, I agree. But we're on a roguelike podcast. I mean, Scott yeah. asked me if I wanted to be on this episode. I'm like, yeah, I like Inscription, but I don't think that's a roguelike game. Yeah. So uh -huh. first, first bullet point that I have here in the Google Doc is honorary rogue. Yeah. In that. Yeah. This game, this game, I don't think is is a roguelike end to end, but I think the first third of this game it solidly qualifies. It depends on how yeah. good you are at card games. Is how much it's a like a roguelike. And also to be clear, there is like a dedicated mode that we'll get into in a little bit that is just like a pure roguelike deck builder. Yes. So that so is true. I'm willing to round up the fact that this is like point or like I don't know what like. 0.6 of a roguelike up to like 1.0 of a roguelike. Just it's, and... a, it's a man with a bushy costume and a glowing eye that's uh, going to Halloween as a roguelike. <laughs> the thing that's odd about this game is even though I don't believe overall that the game really is a roguelike, is a roguelike, unless, unless it presents itself that way, like you're essentially losing out on what I think is like the biggest moment of surprise in the game. Because when I, I I first got introduced to this game, because I think it won like Game of the Year um, on on Polygon uh, in 2022 or 2023, whenever it came out. Um, and I only saw the screenshots of the first part of the game, because that's kind of the part that, I don't know, you're probably going to spend the most time with as you're figuring things out. Um, and the I think that the big shock, like, if you're someone who has played a lot of games that fit into the roguelike genre and you're like, oh, this is a roguelike and you're kind of just like the structure is something like Slay the Spire. And you're like, OK, like I know how these kind of games work. And then sort of the giant reveal is like that is not the end of the game. That is not even like close to the end of the game when you win that. But that reveal only works if you're already interested in roguelikes and that's what you think this game is. You, you, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like that has no, if you're someone who's never played a game before and <laughs> it, you're like, oh, I'm interested in this inscription game. I like card games and you try it, but you're not familiar with the structure of roguelikes, mm -hmm. that shock of defeating Leshy in the first act and then realizing that there's way more like game to play is not a surprise. It's like, just like, no, oh yeah, I guess this is what the game is. There's no rug pull moment if you don't have any rugs in your house. Yeah, that's a good that's a good way to put it. It's like this game is so much based on like toying with your expectations, but like those only work if you already have a lot of preconceived expectations of how things work. Mm -hmm. Like this game is so designed for me. Like, in terms <laughs> of, like, because I've been a Magic the Gathering player, like, you know, my whole, almost my whole life since elementary school, and, like, have always had a thing for card games, really like, you know, roguelikes, and it's just, there's just such a weird amalgam of ideas going on here, and I just, I don't know, I have a real soft spot for games that, like, are 
about like the meta process of making games. I mean, I think that's essentially what a lot of this game is about is like Daniel Mullins has like laid out. He's like, hey, here's a game I made in the first act. And like the rest of the game is like, here's other games I could have made that are like (laughs) kind of the same, but have different mechanics. well, it's like it's like jazz. It's really they, the first act is you know him playing like this is this is the structure, and then the second and the third are like you know just basically riffing with it and uh, uh, really uh, just doing doing whatever over the top over the top of the the structure. And uh, yeah, no, you're you're absolutely right though because uh, he does in many in many places. It's not just like by act. It's like by some char- some characters themselves like are like hey. I, I remember distinctly in Act Three that one robot that's like, "All right, we're gonna like ha- have new rules introduced every time, and they're gonna be like, you choose like the conditions." And uh, and so it's like, "Oh, well, that's a interesting way of presenting like a new s- rule structure to the same sort of game." And that's what he happens like over and over with all the different, um, uh, uh, you know, Act Two, Act Three sort of uh, shenanigans. The quantity, like, this game isn't a tremendously long game. Scott said that, like, people had 20 hours, which seems like a lot to me, because I think you could probably beat this game in under 10. Um, But, like, the quantity of ideas that exist in this game is, like, crazy. Like, there's so many single ideas that could be flushed out into, like, more fully formed games. Like, the third act, where you fight these four different bosses... Like, essentially, every boss has its own, like, idea mechanic that you could build a game out of. And it's just like, oh, this is just a little throwaway thing. And, like, in some ways, I feel like it's kind of to the game's detriment because it's like there's so many mechanics that a lot of them don't really work great. (laughs) Um, But it's just it's a really cool game if you're interested in, like, the way games are designed. Uh, well, it may not be a very long game, but um, for me, it felt like a very long game. <laughs> I can tell you that. Uh, it's uh, yep. There, you're you're absolutely right. There are a lot of ideas in in this game, and I'd be very curious to uh, sit down at a convention for a little post mortem on the development my, uh, of this. Surely, such a thing exists at my, least. My second bullet point in my Google Doc here is we gave Andrew an impossible assignment this episode because <laughs> Andrew was Andrew was operating on a shortened week here and we just happened to drop a game that we all have beaten already into his lap and say, go ahead and play it, but make sure not to look up anything about this game <laughs> in the yeah. process. We also did uh, the thing that's my least favorite, which is like... When someone tells you something's really good and then like while you're watching or playing it, they're like, isn't this so good? Aren't mm. you enjoying my thing? <laughs> oh, <come on. laughs> like, Y'all I, are, are being too hard on yourselves. Um, no, no, I like this is this is unrelated to you. This is just a, a general pet peeve of mine. If you're like <laughs> doing something, if you're watching a movie and you like it or like someone's watching and like and they like it and they're like, oh, this is I love this scene. She's like, well, I probably would have too. But now I'm just thinking about what now I just have to rate it. It's like that's one of like the the very mixed blessing of like having a new partner or something, and you're like, look, I get to sh- like we get to show each other all these movies that we really like, and then you sit down and you can see like their face <laughs> turning, and you're like, uh oh, they are not enjoying this. I have to like, it's just like I yeah, you have to be okay with however people respond. Yeah, I don't I think know. And s- this, sitting a yeah. new romantic partner down and having them forcing them to play Inscription is, is a great like. <laughs> Uh, test of of <laughs> the metal of the relationship. Like here you go. No, um, I I kid of course. And the the other task that was set before me was like, hey, you need to make sure you should you should you should make a concerted effort to beat the game to actually finish it. I would um, say which, that you the main like you make the concerted effort to at the very least get through Act One. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. I uh, was surprised going through it the second time how much I forgot about the other two acts and was all of my memories were just act one well yeah let's i this is like a weird game i mean it's a weird game structurally and like because of that i feel like maybe we should talk about like an overview and then sort of i feel like like it's it's a rogue like podcast we want to talk more about the mechanics in act one but also the whole thing yeah i think the whole thing in general because like the game, the game is like it's not even fourth wall breaking; it's like fifth wall breaking in a way. <laughs> so, like, yeah, I think the 
you know, we, we always have like the, the bit on the program of like our story begins with blah, blah, blah. But in this case, your story continues. You don't start a new game in Inscription. You continue from some previous save that is, is, has existed in this thing. And it's already like a little weird to start because there's some voiceover like, okay, let's let's see what's in this. And you're like, okay, was that like some narrator or something? Um, but you are dropped into act one out of, like, let's say three of this game. Um, yeah, act, there, there's there's essentially an extended credit sequence, mm -hmm. which I think is just more of like, hey, here's more ideas that could have been part of the game. <laughs> yeah, but it's like, like an art, epilogue almost. Yeah, exactly. Aren't really like yeah. playable. I mean, um, they do like the battle disc at the end, like uh, Yu-Gi-Oh style. <laughs> yeah, which is it's pretty cool. <laughs> and I love breed. the way it it's like very PS1 and like it just starts totally glitching and falling apart. Um. But anyway, Act One, uh, you are dropped into a um, a horror themed uh, deck builder, where your your goal is to defeat the opponent across from you, which is just a mysterious glowing pair of eyes. Uh, and the way that you do this is by well, doing the thing that you always do in these deck builder games. You Go through an FTL-style node traversal map. You have events that do certain things, and you're trying to figure out combinations of, like, well, what card is good? Or, <laughs> A, trying to figure out the symbology first. Uh, sure. And then using that knowledge of symbology over time to figure out, like, okay, yeah, this is, this is how I play. And then uh, once you get that system, then you're like me, and you're like, aha, I've figured it out. I'm a smart roguelike deck building player uh this boss is gonna be no pro oh that's a big wall of flying grizzly bears that i now can't defeat and the game is just toying with me and why did everyone say that this game was so great <laughs> thought i understood the systems i thought i was beating it and then like impossible no kobayashi maru no win scenario mode uh shows up well, and um, that's even though the first act of this game that you're describing is the most roguelike game, I do I don't know if one of the characteristics of a roguelike is like, do you guys feel like you have to be able to beat the game like on the first playthrough? Because I it, it I think it may be possible to beat this game in the very first playthrough through like weird sort of glitchy or cheaty methods, but like mm -hmm. it, it this game very much wants you to lose at least one or two times to be able to advance the narrative of the game. Well, that's what that grizzly wall is. Like, right. if you haven't died, you don't get it if you die more times. Uh, but it's like, well, here's a... I don't know if it's actually impossible to beat. But you, you, can, you can beat it. It is theoretically possible. There are videos of people doing it as kind of like a sicko mode challenge. But like... <laughs> Yeah, it's it the the game is telling you that no, like you are you're supposed to go through like a failure cycle, I think at least twice. I think it's it's starting like four or five times, I think. Is it? Uh yeah, because well it's they they have mechanics in there to support um you losing that many times so that they can like basically give you hey here's the op card that you designed and basically they just make it so that the they're like boosting you to a win really strongly by you know be beyond um the, like the fifth run or so but like yeah you're like one two you're supposed to die three maybe you get maybe you get close four you probably should be getting close to, you know almost there and by the fifth if you're not getting it that's that's problematic <laughs> but yeah it's it's very much like the, the mechanics are kind of designed to push and funnel you to try. It becomes almost inevitable that you will win eventually, like just through the mechanics and the bonuses that the game gives you. Yeah. Uh, because, and I, I mean, I think that's smart because like this is a game where the main appeal is the narrative. Like um, to elaborate on what Scott was talking about a little bit, like the basic game mechanic is I think you're in a four, a four by three grid um, and you just have one of the four card slots you can um, place your sort of creatures in, and then they just attack forward. Um, so it's kind of like Magic the Gathering, except the placement of your cards very much matters because they'll attack the enemy directly across from them. Um, and then and it's, the like basic... an, it's like an auto battler in some sense. Yeah, yeah. And the the sort of gimmick behind it is instead of using, um, you know, 
mana crystals like in Hearthstone or Magic, um, you sacrifice your creatures to pay for bigger creatures. Like by sacrificing them, they generate blood, which then you can use for bigger creatures. And no, you have or if two... they die, you you use their bones to their summon. bones. Yeah, and you, <laughs> there's I... always there's two different decks you can pick from. There's like the deck that you build um, with your creatures, and then there's always a squirrel deck, which is essentially um, just a free creature you can sacrifice for something else. It's like your resource pile. Almost. It's, it's yeah. actually kind of like uh, Lone Star. I was like Lone Star and then Cobalt Core. I think that's what it was called. Um, but it's just like the idea of having like the position of two sides and like that being like the main mechanic is like there's multiple things, you know, four plus or whatever on each side. And like the, yeah, you're just attacking straight across or with some strange variants, which each of these games is introduces. But uh, uh, so it's not like a brand new mechanic, but it's just like no. it's, uh, I think, it's well done in its, in its, uh, in the way it did it. Sure, sure. Another interesting thing I think that should be pointed out about the, the card playing format is that instead of having like a, a set number of hit points, there is instead a scale and which is which is interesting. It's like, well, you know, you don't you, you can survive around by putting out enough you know damage as opposed to just like defending yourself. And that can be very fun and dramatic. And there's all sorts of neat I, ways I that think... can be manipulated. I think the scale is a good example of like the way that this game emphasizes like atmosphere and narrative over um, gameplay. Cause like from a gameplay perspective, I think the scale kind of sucks because it <laughs> never, it doesn't tell you how much there's not like a life total where you're like, Oh, I have to deal seven damage to this guy to win the fight. Mm -hmm. um, you sort of have to eyeball it using the scale and you can like highlight over it and it gives you a va um, sort of a highlighted indication of like mm -hmm. how many, but like it's not it, at the top yeah. of it, there are little tick marks. It took me a long right. time to re-realize that, but yeah. But that's what I'm saying. Like you have like the visual little tick marks, but it is not. It is not like it, the point of it is not to portray information to you in the easiest to understand way. It is not uh, like yeah, Slay right. the Spire, where it's like, <laughs> okay, here is the number of damage that your attack will deal. It's like you have to kind of interpret how it will work by like the gold teeth falling into the other. Thing. It's just like, um, and like the m controls of this game are also like kind of weirder than you would think. It's not just like pick a card in your hand to place in a slot. You have to like literally like, you know, adjust your view to either be looking at the board or looking at your hand. And the reason for that, another kind of like example of like a little shock that plays with your expectations is after you die like the second time your opponent tells you to stand up and you're like, what, what is he even talking about? And like you press, um, you know, S on the, on the keyboard twice. And like your character actually gets up from the board and you can walk around this cabin. And like, to me, that's another example of a thing that like, doesn't seem that weird if you don't have expectations. But like, mm -hmm. if you come in thinking that this is just another like roguelike deck builder and then all of a sudden there's this 3d environment you can walk around in it's you get up from Slay the Spire pretty wild and walk around and you're looking at the tower <laughs> yeah oh my god exactly. <laughs> yeah that was definitely wild and uh as, as soon as i stood up I, I heard like the first couple of chords from uh the the doom soundtrack and i was like oh uh, oh maybe, maybe this is a, my my fps um uh, adrenal glands started tingling for a moment but no yeah i thought that was a very good re reveal and then also an exciting reveal was the first time i saw my card in gameplay i had i had like forgotten about the game over sequence i'm like why is there a card that says andrew what is going on <laughs> uh, but that is just uh, a lapse in attention span obviously uh, uh yeah that that is that is an interesting point that you're making woody it's like well this is a good little reveal uh if you are sort of you know conditioned for that reveal through your previous game uh game you, you record, didn't watch through act three then i take it like the um like the uh the, well, there's a very big theme around or maybe maybe you did see this but like it'll actually go into your hard drive and, oh like, yeah find yeah yeah files I, I, and your I, friends I, on steam did Correct. any of you play this on something besides a pc um you know i i played this on my steam deck in uh airplane mode when it was mm. not connected to the internet and so i was a little suspicious like later you know later on in the game when it says it's connecting and doing stuff to the internet i'm like it's not really <laughs> yeah but not really 
Nice uh, yeah, I don't know game. how that I don't know how that mechanic works. I think that's dependent on like other people having, you know, your friends list having played inscription or something like that. I don't. Yeah, I don't I, know. but like I was curious, like if you play this on, you know, a switch and there's that weird boss where it goes into your you have to locate big files on your computer. Like, yeah, I don't know how was, that would work on a that switch. was especially uh, worrying for me on the Steam Deck. I'm like, I have no idea where any of the files on a Linux system know. are. And I'm just like <laughs> blindly looking for like. What's something that's bigger than 45 bytes? Uh, how about this? And then, you know, it, it, it does its that thing's mechanic earlier. But I remember the first time I was playing through that particular sequence that we'll get to in, eventually in Act 3. And I was like, this is this really going to delete this 3 gigabyte file off of my computer? Uh, <laughs> well, and they ask you for the old, like, you're supposed to find an old file for that particular segment. So you usually find, like, some system file that was created when, like, uh, um, you like, got your computer. Like, and then this is like, my okay, high school you... journal that I wrote <laughs> in a PDF or in a, in a Word document. And, and he's like, if you fail, I'm going to delete this. Yeah, yeah. it's 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 clever. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's goofy. So um, Scott made it, sure not to play it on his uh, main computer because yes. then he would have had to have selected you need, you the, the FLAC, burner. lossless FLAC files for our episodes. <laughs> and that's a no, no, no. We can't risk those. I, I want to. So I want to kind of cruise through the first act a little bit um, and then we'll come back to it when we talk about uh, Casey's mod. Um, so basically, like you play this sort of grid battler. And there's um, you can, you know, there's not a lot of necessarily synergy between your cards. It's just about sort of making a giant OP card with uh, some of the various uh, stops along the way. But once you beat the boss, you're like, OK, great. I beat this roguelike game and that was pretty good, I guess. Uh, well, well, mm -hmm. before you do that, I think we probably need to expand a little bit more about the cabin stuff. Sure. Like, yeah, that's fair. So the, your very early on in the game, the cards will start talking to you also. Right. Another sort of fourth wall breaking sequence. And you're like, oh, they're like giving me hints to beat the boss. Oh, this is great. I can like finally. No, no, no Scott. Um, <laughs> I think the dev said himself in the, 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 the development interview diary trailer that that's just a fun little like Easter egg that he put in. You're right. <laughs> Um, which that's an excellent video. Everyone should go watch. Uh, the, the dev seems uh, like a, a funny fella. Like quite they, the they weren't talking to me in my game. Um, well, this game also has like a bunch of like crazy real world. I I mean, is it ARPG? What's the what's the term yeah. for like real world? Like go out and find things, solve puzzles in them. I th I think it's like I think it's ARPG, right? Yeah, yeah. and it it's super but, like I don't know. It, it is just very weird when you re you get onto the wiki for like these kind of games or the Reddit forums and you like pull up these spreadsheets of people having deciphered all of these codes and like actually going to these physical locations and finding things. And you just, I just wonder like, who are, who are these people and how do they have the time and the effort and the smarts and the interest <laughs> to do all this? And why aren't they the president? Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> dedicated uh, gamers. I mean, sorry. I interrupted you, Scott. Yes, the cards start talking to you. Yeah, the cards start talking to you. They start giving you hints. And, and like, crucially, they say, you should go check out this thing over here in the cabin. And you go and check out the thing. And you're like, oh, there's there's like little puzzles laid out all over the place where this is the, your kind of escape room sequence of like, oh, if I turn the knob on the safe to here and to here and you get a clue from the from the um, help lookup book and uh, you do stuff to like unlock more cards um more talking you can cards. get you can get totems that like affect all of your creatures of a certain type so mm -hmm. like it would give all your wolves flying or like a thorn ability and one of the best things you can get in the cabin is like the body of a squirrel so you can give yeah. all your free squirrel resource cards like some built-in ability and that is another way that the game very much is like all right it's time for you to win this act because the <laughs> yeah. squirrel the yeah. squirrel powers are pretty ridiculous yeah that's like a a, a step change in your ability to defeat stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's probably also worth mentioning, too, that uh, the little puzzles that they have in the room and that they have throughout the game, really, are, I think, a really interesting way of introducing upcoming mechanics. Because they're like, mm -hmm. they're like, they they basically have like things you haven't seen yet in the the game so far, like a like a mechanics of like a card or something. And they're, they're like, hey, try and solve this puzzle to like get five the five out of five damage. And um, and you really have no idea what the fuck that thing does, unless maybe <laughs> the rule book or something. And so you're just like basically moving tiles around and be like, oh, you're either 
waiting to learn how it actually works or just moving tiles around until you eventually like crack the code so to that speak kind of guess it took me an embarrassingly long time the first time to understand what was going on yeah no i was I, just like I, why are you moving these tiles around and click a button and something happens I'm like did not grok that it was a simulation of a battle but i, I just think that was a really neat idea uh, in a way of having people engage and really want to try to like I maybe mean, not learn but at least engage with it so that they get the special card or whatever the perk is behind mm. the uh the puzzle so so as act one progresses and you are like losing multiple times like these talking cards will start to morph themselves where they will change shape from a a lowly uh stout to or stout to uh <laughs> a a stout uh rectangularly headed uh weird looking thing that's like a, <laughs> a mutated robot um one of them starts to turn into something resembling a person and then i don't know what happens to wolfie but uh <laughs> but they start transforming the more that you're playing and they start giving you hints of like go to the clock and get get the film roll from there and you know get make sure to release the dagger so you can use the dagger uh as a special item for later and uh, I remember Andrew posting in the in the Discord of uh, using the the dagger to gouge out your eyeball yeah. for the first time. Yeah, I mentioned the that great um, scale mechanic. Uh, you can put your finger on the scale by way of pulling out your own teeth and throwing those on the scale, and pulling yeah. out your own eyeball, uh, which <laughs> those were some um, definitely me memorable moments. Uh, first time you encountered those. But uh, eventually, yeah, so you you unlock all these OP cards, you eventually have like a meta progression mechanic by dying enough that you're building like these super death cards, and you're fighting through the bosses, you're fighting through the, the miner who's pickaxing your cards and turning them to gold, you're fighting through the, the, uh, the angler who uses his hook to steal your cards and pull them to the other side of the board, so now they're his, uh, you're you're facing the the duality of the trapper and the traitor, which was a a neat mind blowing mechanic the first time that I played. I'm like, do you mean the mask was the same the whole time? Uh, <laughs> yeah, when when you fight these bosses, the sort of uh, eye the eye glowing eyes in the back will hold up a mask in front of its face. It's just it, it it does really like this game does a really tremendous job of committing to the atmosphere that it's created. Mm -hmm. Of just being like, okay, you are in an you are in a dark cabin with one other person, and one, they are one madman who has like trapped you here, and he's like, play a game with me, friend. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and then eventually you fight the final boss, which is uh, the the eye eyeball dark darkness man himself from across the table, who uses all of the mechanics from the previous mini bosses that you fought uh to to battle with you and you you beat through beat through that twice and then you have to fight of course the moon like every good uh roguelike video game uh and beating that uh eventually gets you uh I, I, well, I think he I think he kills you anyway or like is No, you you, you take the camera and No, no, no film before roll. that though cuz like I think he's he's like you know, oh, I think we're done here and then like tries to like drag you basically to the death room that you've been to right. before um but because your your talking cards have given you hints to get the film roll from before you wrestle the camera away from him put the film roll in the camera and take his picture and then now the final boss has been captured in the camera and victory and is yours hooray inscription is won congrats everyone let's move on to final ranking <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and um, this is this is sort of the big. Ex I mean, this is sort of I think the the pinnacle of the game moment to some extent because like you wake up, you your character essentially wakes up and finds themselves in a room with like the only thing floating is the icon for new game <laughs> that was like grayed out at the start menu of this game where it only had continue. You find the icon for new game, and then you're essentially stuck in this room and you're like okay i found the icon for new game and you actually have to exit out of the game like back to the main menu and then mm -hmm. select new game which is just uh, i didn't yeah. like that it took me a really long time both times 
to get to that point. I was like, I don't know. I I just like went on the internet. I was like, what 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 did I break? <laughs> <laughs> because no, but and, and and seriously though, because like this game is not the kind of game like it makes you feel like oh yeah, you should just keep walking into the darkness or something. Something's gonna happen eventually, right? Uh, but you yeah, I see. You're saying you just were stuck in. You just kind of hung out in the cabin. Yeah, for like five like, minutes, trying to like okay. poke around it. I was like, well, I need to poke it. Every, am I missing some like corner that I just haven't tried? And like every other part of the game, it rewards you for like poking around until you find the thing that you missed. Mm -hmm. And this one is like, well, no, you're not actually missing anything. We're not gonna tell you that. Yeah. It should put like a like they, they should have like a something like quit game or or just some subtle hint that some maybe something that made it obvious that your game was saved mm, like or yeah. i i mean i don't know but yeah i, I don't know I, I think it's your game was saved and it wasn't like glitched or frozen in some way right because like, i think that's probably the fear is you're like oh i beat him i don't want to exit out now and like <laughs> lose the record of me beating him uh, yeah and, and yeah it's it's interesting playing through the second time because there's and i'm sure we'll get to this later but like the like the meta narrative overarching the game like feel like this feels like a very appropriate moment of like is the game busted like is it broken like the whole game so far has only just been this act one deck building experience there hasn't been anything else so far and then like when that's over it's like well now what and then you you start a new game but before that you go into a full motion video live action uh, recorded sequence of the main character talking about how he discovered this game. Luke Luke Carter, aka yes. the Lucky Carter, who um, is like has a YouTube channel where he opens old packs of card games. Um, you know he does he does pulp, pack polls. Yeah, and, and, you're, and, I, I, and you're watching it on like a weird night uh like 2002 video camera <laughs> and i i just want this is not like a super thing we have to get it but like i think the guy who plays luke is great like i think that he like i mean the acting of like er, at, yeah the the skill of acting for people is not something that comes up all that often on a roguelike podcast <laughs> but like i think this guy does a really excellent job of just being like a very believable dork who posts on YouTube and is like excited about old card games. And I just think it's a really cool extra thing for this game to explore is like the weird sort of like, like it's just, it's something that isn't, you know, explored a lot as an idea is like, what about these YouTubers who open old, you know, card packs? It's just <laughs> like a weird thing to draw creativity from. And I think his performance really sells it. There's there's a point later where there's an, the, another um, actor, this woman who comes in as a representative from the company, and she is like very off putting and not not terrible. believable in that role. Fucking yeah, she terrible. Is, she is very terrible and like. <laughs> well, let's, I, well let's it's weird. Nice. It's like, well, they're like set up like, oh, they're throwing like a threatening em emissary from like this yeah. corporation is going to his door, and she is like. This woman who is way shorter than him and has absolutely like no presence. And, you're and like, it's, it's worth, worth like pointing black out it's, leggings. It's yeah. it's also worth pointing out that Woody does have pretty extensive theater acting experience too. So I feel like if if there's I mean, like I'm in no place to to criticize someone's acting technique, but Woody sure is. But <laughs> I played like, German I, I man I in high school. Well, I said two words on that. German stage. man. <laughs> Look, I I'm not even saying like her performance has to be great. Like it's not, but like there's just Asking. like yeah the the role is just like okay this needs to be an intimidating person that has like this sort of sense of terror being instilled mm. and it's just like that is not the case at all it's one of the few it's one of the few really weird missteps that this game takes it, it reads high school class project vibes yes. like yeah. the presidential campaigns we had to do for ap gov where we were fake presidents and it's like well these are the four people we have in our group so i guess you're the one who's the uh the FBI agent. And yeah, I guess it would also be less surprising if like the guy who played Luke was also kind of n was not very convincing. But like I said, I think he does a great job. And so you see a video, lots of videos with him. And then she shows up later and you're like, wait, what's going on with this? 
She's got the mirrored aviators on. Isn't that isn't that scary? Oh my <laughs> goodness! Uh, yeah, it's a uh, it's it's a bummer. Maybe perhaps it it could have been salvaged with some ADR or some a different camera angle. Um, I think this is a different actor. One but... would argue. One could argue, perhaps. I don't know if I'm willing to make this argument that it, it makes <laughs> uh, the final scene with her all the more surprising that she's not intimidating, and then maybe you don't yeah, expect I... what might happen later. I forgot, like, I knew how this game generally ended because there's this big, like, credits epilogue within the game that is very memorable and crazy. But then, like, it goes back to the live action video and, like, she, I mean, I'm just, we, we already said spoilers. So she just comes in and shoots Luke in the head. Just and, executes like, the game, him. Yeah, the game <laughs> With is a over. rifle, mind you. <laughs> yeah. What? No, is I, it a rifle? It, huh? It, no way. Really? I, I, I job for a pistol. You're not, you're not going to like, come up to someone's front door. They're not going to open the door if they see you holding the rifle. <laughs> no, no, probably I think not. it's a weird, I think it's a weird, unnecessary way to end the game. Like, to me, like, I think that almost, like, just the, like, game crashing would almost be a better way to end it. Than, or, like, a, a, a lawsuit or something. Thing. You should like... just restart your computer. <laughs> there's probably laws against that i think so you get like i was thinking about it like as you're playing through the third act i'm like this would be a great way to like actually hack someone's computer be like ha oh, it's part of the game let them see my file then it's like no it's actually just a virus yeah that's true <laughs> really uh, anyway way. so you yeah once you've seen these videos like luke finds sort of this disc for inscription um i think Which, up oh, to he, this he, point has only been a, a physical card game in the game in the game in the universe yeah. of, that's being presented to you yeah that's right he like finds booster packs at a yard sale which facebook reels keeps trying to recommend to me like people thrifting and finding old video games like i don't want to watch this facebook reel <laughs> i don't care about people finding old video games anyway so stop it facebook anyway um so he <laughs> finds these he finds these packs and like there is um like coordinates on them or or on well, so one like of the a, one of the cards has uh lat long coordinates written on it yeah like, which huh, is super cool that's that's pretty near here and then he like it like abruptly stops recording like with the intent of like he's onto a mission here and then like you have video recorded sequences of him like out in the woods like digging like like actually digging into the dirt <laughs> Which I'm like, what the hell is happening right now? Sure. Like, I was just playing a video game, and now I'm watching some guy dig holes in the forest. <laughs> uh, and then he, yeah, he finds this a floppy disk, which is also I love. Really I love that after this, they even have this scene of him browsing on eBay, finding a floppy disk like USB player. Yeah, like that's just oh, yeah. a really good detail. <laughs> uh, and then he loads it up, and this is where our story begins. Because this is, this I think is where like the game kind of pulls like a Metal Gear Solid 2 rug pull on you of like, this is actually the game. Like Inscription is actually Act 2. Right. And when you go to replace one of the scribes at the end of this main Pokemon Overworld game, that's when it jumps into like the death card cabin sequence. That's when it jumps into the the technology robot sequence. And then you would play like those little mini experiences and then like beating that is like the, the quote unquote finale. But then you have this like completely insane meta narrative, like way over the top of it. That's like all the other stuff. So yeah. Um, act two goes from <laughs> a, uh, what has been so far a 3d escape room roguelike game into a top down Pokemon trading card yeah. game for the game boy color and you're Did like you guys ever play pokemon trading card game for the game boy color i almost failed sixth grade because of that game <laughs> yeah that game is really addictive yeah uh, and... yeah i i certainly have played it yeah it's, it's, just it's, a, it's much Pokemon. red blue yellow i think that was about it no yeah, this, the, this is yeah, like the regular yeah this is pokemon this is the trading card game but in game boy form um, it's kind of it's... a weird game because there's still like an overworld and you're walking around like a regular Pokemon game, but instead of like actually having your animals fight, uh, you're like pulling it's, out your cards. It's like playing. one level too deep because it's it's a card game based off a of video game, but then you made a video game based off the card game. It's like, well, we already wow. had the video game. I think, I mean, I think it works really well because like this was one of the few, oper like the few games out that like was a full-fledged card game that was 
port like you could bring this game portable with you and the pokemon trading game is really a pretty rudimentary card game and like it has a ton of dice of coin flipping which is just super tedious like mm. in person and so like <laughs> having the game do this for you makes it a lot faster yeah like that's like half the game? mechanic of the pokemon trading card game is flipping coins and your attacks do damage based on that oh hmm. i've never i i mean i collected pokemon cards in like fifth grade but i never you never read them i never <laughs> played the game i just got okay. the pretty pictures you never found coordinates on and, them and hid them away uh, but uh, yes woody as, as soon as i got to act two uh we had like a whole conversation on, on discord about oh this looks a lot like uh, this other game certainly and um, certainly they, evokes that that style and right at the top here like you can pick your starting deck and here the game um expands the number of mechanics significantly like you can pick the starting deck of leshy who is the the scribe you fought in the cabin and then it has the same sacrificing um creatures mechanic to pay for new creatures but then there's also a scribe of the dead that pays for things using bones by having your creatures die and then there is the technology scribe which um i can't remember the name of the energy computer, the computer uh yeah which oh, uses uh, energy p03 i think okay Oh, I can't believe I can't remember that super memorable name. <laughs> um, yeah, so you make conduits between your cards on the grid. And then the last one um, is the Magic Scribe, which is um, you play cards that give you mana, which you can use to um, summon more you know, Objectively summon more the creatures. least fun one, right? Yeah, it's un undeniably the least fun because it has the Magic the Gathering problem of mana screw, where you like draw a bunch of creatures, but no gems to actually yeah, play oh, them or you that. draw a bunch of gems and no creatures but it's, but also with the addition of you're using valuable spots you only have four spots and you're right. like well now i have two of them filled with mana that does nothing and the yeah so this is a i think a good example of well so i think act one of this game is very good yep. and i think that the ideas in the rest of the game are like, I think the narrative of the rest of the game is great and super interesting and makes the game what it is. But, like, from a gameplay perspective, I think it's all downhill. Like, yeah, I think well, the I, game. Yeah, I thank think, God, like, thank God that you you came <laughs> onto this podcast, that you that you arrived, Woody, uh, in the nick of time to be the one to say it. I thought I was going to have to be the one no, to say no, it. I think, no, we, all, I think I, we, all, we, we all agree with that. Act one was the peak of the game. The rest of it's downhill, but they got the weird zaniness. That it's like, oh, that's interesting. And all the ridiculous novelty that's just kind of pouring out of an otherwise kind of like, meh, you know, a okay game, and I guess. Like, is it what is, keeps you going. I, I do think it is really like I really had a lot of nostalgia for the way that this act two looks and it's fun to make the decks and it's very cool that you can like mix and match and be like, all right, I'm going to try doing the machines with some skeletons. So when they die, I can, you know, it's like playing multiple colors in magic. But again, like there's just not really enough cards in all. I mean, there's only about maybe 20 opponents that you fight over the course of the whole game 16 to 20 it's like three because there's four overall scribes you have to defeat kind of like a gym leader and each one of them has two or three lackeys that you need to defeat um oh, is it four, four? I, okay um I anyway misremembering actually the, in the you beat four four bosses and each one of those bosses has three underlings yeah, so i think, I think, maybe that, I think that sounds right yeah. actually because there's like and, gravestones that i remember there being three that you had to like complete and it's just like there's not enough cards and sort of like once you find a deck that kind of works and you're winning, you have really no incentive to change it up even when you get new cards. And so like I really struggled with beating some of the first few guys when I just had my starting deck. But like once I started to get more cards, I just like cruised through this. Yeah, because also it's like crucially you're you're not doing any trading. You're only just like continuously adding to your deck and then you're figuring out like what what combination of stuff do i want to build out my deck with from this big pool of stuff that i've accumulated and then yeah like there's not there's not like enough fights for it to be like a fully fleshed out quote unquote game it's almost like this transitionary element of like well, and that's what's so weird about inscription as a whole and like this whole pro like i don't know what the solution is mm -hmm. because i think that to make this act better it needs to be more flushed out and like it needs to be a bigger world and there needs to be more cards so you're actually challenged to try and experiment with the deck building there needs, but, to, be, it, well, there needs yeah. to be something where you like 
one deck can't be all of the other decks. Like yes. there's no incentive to be like, oh, well, this deck counters this deck. Because yeah, you, exactly. you counter every deck by being better than by just having power. The the problem is though, like I, I agree agree with you, Colin, and it, 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 I wish it was more fleshed out like that, but I also don't want it to be any longer than it is. Yeah. Because like you're so kind of engaged with like what is this weird game that you're like really excited to see what the next thing is. And it's hard for these sort of act two and three to not feel a little tedious because you're kind of engaged with like what is going on in this overall story. I think act, act two serves the purpose of explaining the end of act three, because like, it sets up that there are like, oh, that first guy that you beat in act one, oh, he's just one of like four other bosses in the like four other like uh main bosses in but the But these game. are like these are like real life, I mean, quote unquote real life in the world of like Luke. Like these are like real sort of demonic presences that like Well, I, like if if you were like playing the physical edition of inscription, you know, you would have like your electricity type cards that would be leshy and your psychic type cards that would be grimora's cards etc cetera, etc cetera. and then like oh my god there's this like video game version and then like oh there's like well i don't know if it's explicitly said that they are like like self-aware sentient things at this point in act two right but there is like i think that the, i don't know i think what this game is going for is like real indication of like say you know satanic demonic forces that have like infiltrated this card game playing company and like mm -hmm. resulted in like the death of an employee like yeah that, I, that's i think yeah. that's what it, and that's why i think that it has a lot of like creepy pasta vibes in yeah. fire like circumstances you you yeah. never listeners you never want to find yourself in fire like circumstances <laughs> that's a bad state of being let me tell you um uh, what I, I uh we just recently reviewed uh Slay the Spire, um one of good the game finest game. games around. Yes. Um legitimately very good. And um I lodged a sort of soft complaint that it's like, eh, hey, you know, it's supposed to be a deck builder. I'm not really getting to properly build my deck. What's the deal? Come on, I don't get enough opportunities mm -hmm. to add and modify and customize. Well, guess what, Andrew Harshman? Here's your opportunity <laughs> in act two of inscription. And I immediately like poo pooed that idea and was like, eh, autocomplete. I don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's um, very so tedious. I, I, I fought that for a while, but then once I actually started engaging with like building the deck around, I don't know. I guess let's see, I beat Leshy and then I went to go fight uh, the, the, the skeleton, uh, spooky, spooky Jones down at the skeleton hut. Uh, what's, what's the <laughs> name of that character? No, you had uh, it. It's Spooky Jones, the skeleton hut. <laughs> Thank Grimora. You. Grimora. Grimora, the scribe of the which, dead. Which is a cool name. Grimora, the scribe of the dead. Then I'm like, okay, now I, I actually have to like make something that's worth a worth a hoot. And um, you know, initially for my uh, <clears throat> meathead FPS brain, uh, that was a little bit difficult. But uh, once I you know started working working with the uh, the deck building system, it was fun. But it sounds like that was not the experience that y'all had. Y'all found something good and rocked with it. Um, yeah, I, I tend to agree. It's it's uh it's good that this segment is not too much longer. Yeah, I, I remember Act Two the first time I played it being like novel at first, and then just kind of being a slog by like the last couple bosses. And then I was but, just but that, like I don't know. That's the thing that's so weird about inscription as a whole, is like I think I would happily play a game that was just Act Two. Yes. That was more fleshed out. Like yeah. I would have been all about this game for like Game Boy Color or something um, that had more cards and more mechanics or like the ability to trade with other people or, um, you know, sort of more of that. But like sandwiched in after you've played like this pretty cool atmospheric sort of more mechanically rich roguelike, it just feels a little underwhelming As, but aside from the shock of like what is going on mm -hmm. um anyway so you make your way through this and regardless of what character what regardless of what character what scribe you've chosen to replace po3 the supercomputer like takes over the game at this point yeah like, and turns into a 3d yeah. model ah <laughs> <Ooh. laughs> which i knew oh my uh-oh that's that's not good and i love this 3D. aesthetic spinning I love the aesthetic of like 
the the screen getting like errored out in places and you're just like is my com like my computer's not actually crashing right now right <laughs> it just has like just enough believability to it that you're like just a little on edge and you're like i know the game is still playing but like, just that 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 one percent is this game actually a virus <laughs> have i installed a virus on my computer and it's now crashing it mm -hmm. andrew you should really go in without like looking up anything about this game <laughs> and press turn off press, your press antivirus press. while you play also <laughs> Um, so th I think this is a good example of what Will brought up in the like, I I am I am famously amongst knowledgeable circles anti jazz, but I do know I do think that this is a good example of what Will is talking about because it's like Act Two brings in a lot of mechanics that you saw in the first game and then sort of sets up a lot of new ones that you see in Act Three, and then Act Three just kind of brings it all together it's like you there's a lot of these little smatterings of things and then like that these act one and two really set up and then act three is like all right we're gonna draw from this pool because now you understand sort of what the basic structure is and we're gonna find lots more ways to kind of alter the tempo and things like that uh, i i th there's also like visually it's very cool because it's um, similar to Act One, where you're up against this supercomputer sitting across from you, but it's like a holographic board with like a, you know, dot matrix hologram. Uh, and you can look down and you see your hand walk manacled around. to the like metal desk. <laughs> yeah. What do you, what, I have a very important question though. All jazz or just some? Jazz? I mean, really? <laughs> this, not, not, not all jazz? Are that's fair. Right. That's fair. Hashtag hashtag not all jazz. All right. That's yeah. That's not. That's right, not boys, fair take to it me. To your own jazz jazz yeah. pro con. No, this is podcast. gonna be the bebop jazz <laughs> podcast. Now we're gonna be talking about Bill Evans for the rest of the session. I, I, I did think I do think that that was an apt comparison for this game though. Um. Yeah, and I think that much like Act Two, like this is a very cool transition, and when you start it and like. Each time you see a new mechanic in Act 3, you're like, oh, that's a really cool mechanic. Um, because there's a lot of, like, taking a sort of... Your cards are essentially floppy disks, and you can insert them into these drives to give them new abilities. Um, this is a much... This this overall, like, much more than Act 1 allows you to really kind of customize your deck. But I think that this is probably even... This is even sloggier than Act 2. I, I feel yeah, like by the time I was done with Act 3, I was really ready to be done with Act 3. It, yeah. it adds way too much of the, like, overworld stuff, which is... Uh, it, it has a fun aesthetic for, like, one minute, and then you're like, it's not really fun to look at, though. Right. It's, like, I, fun as I, a... I, it's, a it's, it's fun as, like, a... This is the game like a kid in a cartoon is playing in the background kind of thing. You're like, ah, oh, fun, a video game. <laughs> and I mean, that's like, that's I think, comparison. an issue with this game in general, which is, I think, the only part of this game that is like mechanically very good is the first act. And like the rest of the game is so idea rich and creative that I still really like it, but it's not really fun to play the way that the first act actually is. It, it transitions from, like, like, gameplay mechanics to, like, gameplay narrative. Yeah. In a way. Um, but yeah, like, Act 3 is, like, is like if you took the 3D-modeled escape room sequence from Act 1 and applied that to, like, the top-down Pokemon world of Act of Act 2, like, I didn't realize it the first time I was playing it, but this time when I was playing it, like, Oh, the the map that you're playing through in Act Three is literally just the map from Act Two. Yeah, maybe with like a little like a little bit expanded here and there, but instead of going to Leshy's cabin from Act Two, you are going to the foul backwater, as it's called by the robot, who says <laughs> he's he's made improvements to the game after taking it over. Improvements in air quotes. Um, and I I love the little detail that he calls all the other scribes's um like uh layers with all these like pejorative nouns of like the foul backwater or like filthy corpse world or gaudy gem land uh and then you have uh when you go to to p03's factory equivalent in this overworld it's called the resplendent bastion 
I'd listeners to... uh scott actually has little cute nicknames like this on discord <laughs> for us it's kind of rude actually um yeah with regards to how much of a slog it is um i i, I didn't realize that um initially initially i couldn't get past like the first couple of fights in like act act uh, three and we're talking on discord and it's like somebody mentioned getting lost and i'm like oh no there's gonna be some <laughs> navigation so i'm like all right i'll do it right let me get out my my scratch paper and immediately my little drawing like went off Whoa. the page like immediately <laughs> i'm just like oh fuck <laughs> what am i gonna do here? I, I, yeah, soon after i'm like yeah we're going we're going to a gameplay video i'm i'm sorry i can't were you um, were you guys actually getting lost? I know Colin mentioned it, but I I don't know if that yeah, like that oh, just Scott, feels like how it, dare you? I got lost the first time I played because there are some aspects of like of this like like room by room sequence that you're traversing almost kind of like a Zelda dungeon, yeah. And there like it loops around itself in some in some instances. And, like, well, and I mean graphically, it all kind of looks the same. True, but. Um, until you realize, like, oh, actually, it was just it's it's basically just the map from Act Two, and then like I completely forgot what Act Two looked like from the overworld perspective. So I yeah, like I would get lost and be like, oh damn, I lost that fight, and then you have this Dark Souls style like loot drop mechanic where you lose all of your money, and then you have to like you are uh, lifted up by like a drone, and then like dropped earlier at a checkpoint, you have to like fight your way back to your money to get. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I I don't know. I think that this this section is kind of just the least inspired. Like, I'm not crazy mechanically about like the sacrificing creatures to play new ones, but like that is pretty different than most other card games. And in this section, they just have like the Hearthstone, you gain another mana every turn mechanic, mm -hmm. um, which is intuitive. Uh, but like eventually, like, I don't know, to me, it consistently comes down like, survive till you get six mana and then play the guy who has two attack and like the forked attack yeah. like the yeah. double gunner just like deals a bunch of damage and so it's just kind of consistently like that and the only real new mechanic or like the main new mechanic is like a crosshair that allows um mm -hmm. certain creatures to attack any square on the board which is pretty useful and like is really easy to break like this this section in general is like pretty easy to just make some nuts cards like you could just make a turret that auto fires and give it like the death touch ability so it automatically <laughs> kills anything it hurts and it's just like all right i'll just draw this every time uh -huh. and yeah again it's just like it's similar to act two it's like it's cool to see these new mechanics but the game never really forces you to use them enough and it just becomes too easy and you're just kind of like all right i'm just gonna like cruise through this and i'm you're more you're more I, for me. I'm much more interested in like what's going to happen next. So like when Po3 makes me stand up and survive and like solve captcha puzzles, it kind of <laughs> just feels like all right, game. You're kind of just wasting my time uh -huh. at this point. Yeah, and I think uh -huh. that like well, I think partially it builds into like the fact that like Po3 is supposed to be the bad guy sure. of of like of of these characters and like Wait, really. <laughs> yeah, was it was anyone bothered by that? He seemed so helpful in the first act. Um, well, as I discussed, P Will is definitely a PO three, so he he, he very <laughs> much he very much could relate. Also, PO3 on the apologist yeah. on the second playthrough, uh, that that helpful stoat that is giving you all the tips uh, at uh, in, in Act One, I really see he's, he's kind of a jerk. He's just like you play a card and he's like total misplay. Why would you do that? <laughs> awful, awful decision. Uh, and then Grimora, who is channeled through the stink bug card in Act 1, is always like, oh, sweetie, you're just doing such a great job. I'm so proud of you. And uh, you really kind of see that character, like, come, like, those characters, like, are very fleshed out before you even realize it, which is very interesting. So, uh, yeah, and and so the 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 sarcastic robot, who I, I posted in, in the Zoom uh, chat here, I'm pretty sure his head was the inspiration for the play date console like the wind up thing that's like it's like a wind up <laughs> I just watched like, a review of that yeah game yeah. boy thing um it could it, be it's i would have to guarantee that's where the inspiration for it came from but anyway um also scott the link you posted is just play.date which is like a very off putting web page to just <laughs> click on <laughs> What a URL. Right, right. It's, it's going to be bought That's out right. by the match group any minute now without yeah. realizing what it is. Um, so it looks like the it looks like Bumble. It's got the orange and uh, yellow and black. 
uh, uh anyway well let's let's keep playing so act three um, yeah so act yeah. three you are you're going through and you're fighting um the four bosses again the same kind of sequence from act two but there's a bit of a twist that you don't that you're not realizing what you're getting yourself into here because you go to leshy's cabin equivalent here you fight the photographer boss who takes you you are taking pictures with this camera for something and then you you beat that boss you're like and then the po3 is like huh very interesting photos you took there wink wink you go to grimora's crypt uh whose boss fight has the the mechanic of as we discussed before like you a granting inscription access to your hard drive that comes up with a, a, a fun prompt that you're like i sure uh <laughs> why not you click and then you use that as a means of like tilting the scale by putting like gigabyte sized files which do like five damage or whatever um you go to uh uh gaudy gem land where there's an unfinished boss and you you set the rules for that boss of like how you want to fight them basically quote completing the game and then in uh p zero's three factory you fight uh golly who connects to the internet to to get your steam friends uh engaged in combat with you and you are fighting the steam profiles of of other people in your friends list and seeing andrew's card come down and will's <laughs> card or like profile picture like from steam come down with like numerical attributes tied to them like first time i was playing through i'm like oh oh my god what is happening this thing it really is using my computer and connecting to the internet in a very uh unsettling way um and scott i don't want to i don't want to belittle you here but i just got to say you were a pretty weak ass card like <laughs> i just i just defeated your 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 steam profile in one shot yeah that sounds about right um and then once you have beaten all four of these bosses you go back to the the four headstones to to finish the great transcendence which has been kind of uh uh being dripped with info here and there of like no 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 we've got to we've got to finish the great transcendence everything will become clear once the great transcendence has uh, and yeah and so what is what is the great transcendence it's po3 is like you have made you finished inscription the game and now he's ready to put it out on the steam marketplace <laughs> to infect and have control over everyone's computers yeah you you have taken the last step where so we've kind of talked a little bit about the meta narrative thus far of the someone in the inscription physical card factory had made this game this digital game that then became self-aware and was getting out of control so they buried it but somehow the coordinates to that thing got onto one of the cards and into luke carter's hands he goes and digs it up plugs it into his computer and these self-aware sentient well, computer programs <laughs> have have well, I guess PO3 in particular has a motivation of, well, we're going to escape out into the internet and then nothing can stop me. Um, and so the Great Transcendence is, yeah, like literally uploading the game to Steam for digital distribution. And then there will be thousands of copies of Inscription out on the internet. Um, but the other three scribes have a plan. And so this is where you you something happens in P03's factory where you're like, oh, stamp security camera keeps going offline. You need to go check it out, human slave. You go down, you solve some more capture puzzles, and uh you go down into an area that like act two, there's there's lots of like narrative parallels here where like in act two, there's this like distorted like bugged card that goes through a sequence of like dredging it up from this old data that um that the game is involved with very again very kind of creepy pasta um augmented rpg real life kind of deal thing um and you go down in like the act three equivalent of that and that's where the other scribes are hiding and they have this plan of all right uh as soon as P po3 tries to enact the great transcendence we're gonna kill him be like okay great <laughs> that sounds good to me uh and then the great transcendence happens and then p03 turns to the camera and says thank you luke for unleashing me to the internet and then 
you he, like from this perspective where so far the game that you've been playing has been like a recorded camera of the screen he's like oh shit oh shit what's just happened and then you see leshy's hands reach out from behind like you've seen so many times before grab the robot by the head and just rip his head off sparks flying everywhere and that's it the great then, transcendence has been has been canceled canceled and then grimora i believe um with with not with without the collaboration of the other scribes decides to essentially delete inscription like yeah, so for the leading the, the game of from all. within itself yeah and, and then this... so you at this point you've essentially beat the game and you go on this sort of long series of cutscenes where you're kind of seeing the gameplay mechanic if any if all because you've seen the gameplay mechanic if like leshy in act one you've seen like okay what is inscription if leshy is in charge mm -hmm. and you've seen what is inscription if po3 is in charge and then it shows you like grimora has a version of this game yeah, which kind like of weird um, creepy underground tomb and the arms reach out and like knock on the board yep exactly and then um i don't i don't think it's really possible to fail any of these um but they are cool sort of again different sort of jazz riffs on like what this game could have been um you know just as, as different ways to approach it and um then you see i don't even remember the name of the uh magician scribe magnificus but, yeah he looks like um he looks like that madonna mcdonald's character um <laughs> Grimace, the big purple guy. Grimace, yeah, he looks like Grimace, <laughs> but like Christmas tree Grimace, and um, it is a very cool, like, yeah, PS One aesthetic. But you have like battle discs, and you're looking down at above and summoning different um characters. Well, Again, it, it's I, it's all cool and weird, but it's not like yeah, it's I think, not mechan well, mechanically rich. It's just and, interesting, and I think it's important to point out in this kind of like epilogue sequence or like pre epilogue sequence, maybe like this this ending sequence that Prepilogue. like. Prepilog. Ooh, that's a good word for it. Um, that like everything is being all the game assets are being deleted as you are playing with them. So like if there was like a risk that you were going to fail, like the scale like deletes and disappears. And like as you are as you're playing Grimora's game, like it's like okay, like you're playing through like one one phase of a of like um of her game, and then you get to this boss fight. Oh, the boss has been deleted. Uh <laughs> and then she's like, okay, well. We would have had a great time together, but I can see that uh, it's getting a little late. I can tell that you're getting getting tired. This uh, this it's uh, kind of and it's interesting that like they find kind of a bittersweet like emotional thing. Like you interact with Leshy again, and Leshy's like, "Hey, we had a we had a lot of good times together in Act One <laughs> when I kept killing you. Remember that?" And you're like, "Yeah, we did have some good times, Leshy." Um, but it's kind of cool to see these characters that you know seem so ominous being like, "Hey, we just." We just wanted to play this weird game together. Well, yeah, and like when you're fight when you're facing Leshy, like when you lose, which I'm pretty sure you do automatically because he's very difficult to beat. He's just like, I, we don't need we don't need to worry about the scales. Like we could just keep playing. Yeah, yeah. And and as, like, as like all the stuff around him is being deleted, and it feels like it has this very uh like sad like um vibe to it of like uh, I think he has a line of something very poignant of like you know. You you only realize the things that you like uh, until like you don't have enough time to enjoy them anymore or something like that. And I was just like, why is this game making me sad here? <laughs> <laughs> this guy who was like strangling me to death for hours before, um, but like, and then he reaches out like with his hand and you you shake his hand and then he's deleted and you're like, yeah. oh, oh, and then Magnificus happens and then so anyway after that, um, yeah, I think like Magnificus is. Uh, game is very much like um you know that episode of the simpsons where it's like all those like super short things like the super short uh like uh like mini sodes and then at the very end professor 22 frank... short films yeah, about yeah. springfield and then professor frank comes running up at the end and he's like oh uh, i was uh was gonna tell you what i was gonna have but like i just been so caught up with all the craziness but anyway let's let's do all of the the professor frank show and then it starts like rolling to credits he's like no wait no wait i still have plenty of stuff to tell you don't wait for me that feels kind of like his thing. And I'm I'm glad that like the the game accelerates that process because I'm like, like, I don't know if I really want to have the stamina to play through like a whole nother. No, I was very the first time I played through this game, I was very worried when the Grimora segment started that I was gonna <laughs> have to play like through an act of like Grimora theme <laughs> thing of the same mechanic. So I I'm happy 
I think it's very cool that they cram all this stuff at the end, and I'm happy the way that they that I don't have to play the game anymore. Yeah, but you, anyway, and then they cut out to the the full motion video again, and Luke's dead, and the game's over. Yeah, um, well, well, you missed. Well, we talked about the the Yu Gi Oh fight sequence with PS One yeah. graphics that, uh, and then all that stuff gets deleted. And Magnificus is like crawling towards you, like, no, wait, there's still we still need to, and then he gets deleted. Uh, and then yeah, the, the, the you go touch the old file. <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't don't go looking through that old data. Trust me, um, or maybe some of the fan mods. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. So. Uh, the game is deleted. The day is saved. Uh, but Luke has been getting some phone calls or he's been making some phone calls to journalists saying, hey, there's this game that has been put out. I don't know what the deal with this is, but it's hacking my computer. And then the guy on the other end of the phone is like, so you're saying you're saying the game is haunted. What's going on here? And you can tell it's like some some guy who's like never played a video game before frantically taking notes. And then uh yeah, he gets he gets a a warning from one of the the game Funa security I don't know detail people. Uh, I think this is this is at the act act two to three transition. That's when like the warning happens, and then after act three is when like Luke has like lost his mind playing this game, and there's lots of fun sequences of like Blair Witch style like camera running around and him just like cackling maniacally um possible house invasion at one point you're using then, the term fun very uh liberally there i think uh, I don't, as soon as those videos come up every time i'm like oh god do i really am i gonna i'm about to watch a bunch of like clips of this guy and i'm just it just uh it started hurting me but i guess this is my <laughs> second playthrough maybe i liked it the first time i don't remember yeah mm. um yeah i mean it's it's not something you encounter in games at all really uh let alone the games that we've been playing so it's it's a wacky interlude but yeah like this final sequence is you know he's he's trying to get someone to come and like tell his story to and the game funa devs are out to get him and he just gets a knock on the door opens the door and bam that's it shot through the heart and he was too here late. to blame <laughs> It's gotta be a headshot. Uh, there was no, so, so, there was no yeah. movement at all after. Um... No, it was, it was, it was definitely a headshot. On, on the one hand, uh, like the production of these, these full motion video sections, like they weren't able to cast and direct um, the game Funa employee super well, but they were able to somehow capture like the he gets shot, the camera hits the ground, and then perfectly like a pool of blood. Uh, comes into camera, comes into focus, and then there are like two playing cards that get like soaked with blood and then start floating on the surface. And like, <laughs> it, uh, how did they do that? Incredible! Like, so on the one hand, they're they were able to craft this brilliant shot, but uh, then there's a few spots where they faltered. Yeah, uh, kind of a dramatic, um, potentially unnecessary ending to the game. Yeah. Uh. Anyway, this game is cool. Um. <laughs> it's I think it's very, I mean, to me, I think you could almost break, like, obviously there's infinite ways to categorize things in video games, but, like, to me, a pretty simple um, categorization is, like, is this a game that you play through once for the narrative story? Um, like, most sort of, at least for me, like, most, you know, RPGs or an action-adventure game or something, or is this a game that you play through you know, in multiple, you know, just like lots of different short settings, um, you know, just over and over, like, which, which is more common, you know, the style now, like, in, you know, any any sports games, any mm -hmm, arena mm -hmm. shooters, um, you know, uh, any, any sort of maybe roguelike, any roguelike, any card <laughs> game. And so like that to me is a reason why I don't think this falls very well into the roguelike session, um, that roguelike criteria, because like most roguelikes whether you beat it or not, like the hope is, okay, like I will probably come back and play this again. Cause I just enjoy the mechanics. Mm -hmm. And like, to me, this is a game where you play through once and you get, and you like the joy comes from the narrative, even though, um, I, not that I had a bad time playing it through a second time. I still think it's really good. Um, it's just like once a lot of those surprises are removed, um, it is, less good than the first time that you played yeah through. i'm gonna strongly agree with that i had 
I had less fun playing it this time. I, I feel like much of my fun was like, oh, I remember when I was surprised by that the <laughs> last time I played. Yeah, I think like the the surprise bit is the draw here. And when people say don't look up anything about it, like they're they're telling you that the surprise is the draw. Um, I will say that like I wasn't entirely sure if Act One could stand on its own as like a standalone ex experience. Like so, you beat the game and then you're you're able to unlock uh, Casey's mod, and Casey is. One of the creepy pasta narrative people who was like working she, on the she's game. She's the person who was killed in the fire. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so there's like you know th this this haunted aberration of Casey per persisting through the game. And so Casey's mod is like, um, what what if Act One and like a like a very basic ascension system tied to it, no talking well, cards. No yeah, Casey's meta mod is basically like, what if this game was the game that you thought it was when you first started <laughs> right. it up? Uh -huh. like, um, and I, I have to say, like, I, I think it could stand alone on just its own two feet by itself and be really, really good. And like, if if it was just that, I think it would be like a solid like eight point five or nine out of ten. Easy. Wow. I um, I feel like that is that is generous. Like I, the re well, the reason why is because like I think we were kind of alluding to earlier that like Act One, eh, you know, it's, I mean, we're comparing it to the Goat Slay the Spire, which is nothing sure. but synergy building. Um, I think like Casey's mod really demonstrates that there is like a level of synergy building that you can do in the game, and there's more. There's like there's more cards to do it with. So yeah. it's like it's a more kind of fleshed out. And there's more sort of event spots that you can hit. Yeah. And there's, um, you, you can you can make many you can do much more broken things in Casey's mod. Yeah. Like you can keep la laying symbols onto one card. Um, yeah. So yeah. It, and so I think that like as just a a contained experience in and of itself, it it works really well. And I think if that was just the game, it would be great. Um, there are, it's worth pointing out, uh, fan mods have taken content from the other parts of the game and made a Grimora standalone mod that I was like, okay, I have to play this for evaluation purposes. It's exactly like what you would expect, uh, like a Grimora's segment of Act 3 to be. If you also had, like, like the audio design in this game is amazing. And like this, like it's very like well-tuned and very like elegant for what it is. I don't know what's going on with this Gramora mod, but like it sounded like a shotgun was shooting nails at a chalkboard for me. <laughs> where like some of these, like, because you know, you you go up against like the um the trapper, the trader, the angler bosses, and they all have like kind of like different like voice lines to them and stuff. And then for Gramora's mod, the boss that I fought just it sounded awful. Like, I don't know what was happening, but um, but it was a a very displeasing experience for me uh but it's really popular like it has like 87,000 downloads on on the inscription mod manager site and then I mean, there's I a will stand say, like i think that this is a game that due to its design kind of makes you want to like delve into some of the ideas of sure. mods because like this game essentially just gives you like potential mods at the end of it and there's like here's four other things this game could be and so, like, it is curious to, like, explore more of that. Yeah. Um, I think I, like, after I had played, like, another, I don't know, five or six hours of Casey's mod and then going into Grimora's mod, I'm like, you know what? I think I'm, I think I've gotten my fill for inscription for, sure. for the year. And I would say that, like, yeah, like, playing it through the first time, I think I kind of shared Andrew's sentiment of, like, feeling grindy, feeling like, eh, I don't know, is this worth it? For me, coming back the second time, I thought, I thought it was much better. Hmm. What rank might you have given it? Uh, or is it that time? I'm just Will not, is, just Will is wanting clock. to move it's it along. Jones in. Yeah. Um, sure. Yeah. We could jump into rankings. Uh, for me, uh, Inscription ranks pretty highly. I couldn't rank it higher than Slay the Spire because I feel like that would be sacrilege. Sac 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 whatever that word is. It <laughs> would be absolutely incorrect. It Not would be good. bad, but uh, <laughs> so I'm going to put it just behind Slay the Spire to 9.2. Um, I think this game, like, yeah, it's it's maybe not a like a roguelike in the strictest sense from end to end. It it 
it can't be because of how its narrative structure is built. But I think even if you just surgically cut out the part that is roguelike and just took that out, it would still be like really well designed and like really good aesthetic and well balanced and like interesting and different. And like for whatever reason, like I just I like got into the the systems for that much better than I did the first time that I tried playing Slay the Spire. Um, obviously, like Slay the Spire is clearly better as like a real roguelike deck builder game, but I think inscription holds up. And I think like all of the the wackiness with its fourth wall breaking extra stuff on top of that, just like that's that's what would push it from like an 8.5 normally if it was just act one to like a 9.2 uh, for, for this particular rating purposes. Cause it's just it's so bananas. Um there's it's just like there's there's a lot to it. And the, I remember the first time that I played it, hitting that great wall of grizzlies and just being like, I don't know about this, and really having a pretty un unpleasurable experience. But I feel like the more like it's it's kind of like a fine wine where just kind of sipping at it a little bit at a time. Uh, and again, this is where we kind of pinned Andrew in a corner uh, and gave him an, a homework assignment to do, which is everyone's favorite thing. Um, but like taking your time with it and then revisiting it later after you've had time to kind of like think about it for a little while and then forget it and then come back to it and be like, oh yeah, I think this thing is supposed to happen. Oh yeah. And you can kind of cruise through it a little faster. Um, yeah. I think this game is great. Uh, 9.2. What else am I looking through in my uh, Google notes here? The only, I guess the only complaint that I have is yeah, the casting for the game Funa hit woman, but that's it really. I think like everything else is so on point with its wackiness if if that's like the only like major criticism I have, then I think it's a pretty solid ass game. Well, uh, allow me to be sacrilegious here with uh, my review. Um, sacrilegious on the sacrilege. That, yeah, I'm standing on that sacrilege and I'm ready to take a flying leap. So, uh, I mean, to be clear, uh, you know I have not played a lot of deck builders. They are not my favored genre um so it's obvious that you know this game would not be um my favorite game would not rank super high uh i have been quoted as saying um i, I spent a, I spent a lot of my life being very worried about spoilers whether it be tv spoilers or video game spoilers book spoilers etc cetera, etc cetera. um and uh, in that 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 is that is a bygone age. I now sort of live by more of a creed of ah, you know, feel free to talk about the media you like to me, and you know, if you tell me about a spoiler, um, I generally believe that if a piece of media cannot survive being spoiled, then it's not that great in my in my estimation. <laughs> like good shows are still good, even if I know that certain like intense you know twists are are, are coming. And it, it kind of feels to me like Inscription uh, leans a little too heavily on, on, on the, that, the, that surprise factor, on those, on those not being spoilered, on going in without knowing anything. Um, however, it is you know, heartening to hear uh, that um, y'all did have enjoyable replays. That's great. Um, I guess what, what, what is my big issue with this game? I would have far preferred it if Act 1 had been a little bit longer, if the, I found the uh, escape room cabin stuff very intriguing, if there had been a little bit more of that, and if Act 2 and 3 had been like 15 minutes each, like just mm. like gameplay for the sake of story, like let's go, let's Bas go. Basically like the 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 end, but just like a more flushed out that indeed that that's for me uh yeah. an fbs meathead who doesn't want to learn new mechanics and <laughs> doesn't want to have to understand how cards work um so they have two sides what uh <laughs> and so for me this is coming in at uh number 18 in my stack rating uh ranking uh 5.635 and the number is so specific because i wanted to make sure that it was just behind dot age and just ahead of wilder myth um yeah that's uh i'm gonna throw it to uh, okay. will oh i mean to colin <laughs> uh i'm going to give it uh an eight and i uh have exactly the opposite experience as scott uh i 
I will give it a nine for the first playthrough and a seven for the second playthrough. I found it much more enjoyable the first playthrough. Uh, without the surprise, nine, I thought right? the first. Hmm? Then you should give it a nine, right? Because you're not. I mean, the, doing it again was just for the podcast. So like, well, but, it be... but it, now now my view of the whole ah. game is tainted. <laughs> no, li literally, it's like oh, it, you know it. I mean, I think that's fair. One of the selling points of roguelikes is like the ability to replay them. Mm -hmm. And yeah. like the enjoyment that you get on, you know, following playthroughs. I have played games a second time through before and been like, oh, that was fun. I remember why it was fun. Um, and this felt like uh, the first act is still very fun. First act, for sure, the strongest. Um, even even knowing most of the spoiler stuff, I still think it has a really good sense of like ambiance and like the music for like the final couple battles is really good. It really builds into the like you're in this weird creepy cabin and if you lose he might like eat your eyeballs or something um uh and then like the second and third act are just kind of a grind and i remember being like so intrigued by like where the game was going in the first playthrough that like you know i'm just like all right cool i'm crying I'm, I'm grinding through i'm getting through stuff like i'm learning new things like i'm so just i'm ready to know where this is going and the second time through, after knowing where it's going, you're like, yeah, this is really mostly just a grind. Like, you know, a couple times, where, like, in the very, very beginning of Act 2, when you aren't very good, you lose a couple times, that feels, like, not very interesting. And then by the end of Act 3, I was just like, eh, like, how fast can I play through the cards? Like, getting annoyed at having to, like, look up and down because it means I couldn't play cards as fast. Uh, and just being like, all right, I'm ready to be, I'm ready to get to the cutscenes at the end. And um, then it was over. I, I will go next just because I, I think Colin and I had very similar experiences. Um, yeah, I yeah, think so, most... So, yeah, Woody, your rankings so far, your very official rankings sure. that can't be changed at all, ever. That's fine. Um, um, I, I I think, yeah, I, I yeah, mean, so, my first so, thing... Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Scott. Oh, well, yeah, so so your number, you've been on a lot of... We only bring you in for the good shows. Um, sure. Your uh, number one is Enter the Gungeon, followed by Dead Cells, then Into the Breach, FTL, and then Vampire Survivors. So where sure. where would this kind of stack up against? I mean, you? again, uh, my, my thesis statement for is I don't think this is a roguelike game. Like, I, I think straight up, like... Um, <laughs> but... Um, so I would really play it a different reason than all of those other games. Um... But I'll put it uh, at number four between uh, behind Into the Breach, but ahead of FTL. Um, because, I mean, I really like this game. And like I said, I think this game really caters to my interest as someone who's been into like trading card games for a long time. And I think a lot of the joys of this game come from like building on preconceived um, ideas about trading card games and about roguelikes and stuff. Um, and so. I think this game is is cool and memorable, but I think it to it scratches a different itch than most of the reasons that I might play a roguelike game. And I think I think Scott is being pretty generous with the mechanics. Like I played Casey's mod a couple times and like just kind of felt like I randomly died to big armies of flyers that I sort <laughs> of had no way to deal with. Um so it felt it just felt sort of more random than something like um slay the spire where i felt like i had a little more control over my own strategy um but like from a pure a pure mood um it this game is is very much worth playing through once if you're someone who is interested in sort of just is just interested in video games and like weird games which is always something i've had a soft spot for because i'm well Cool. Well, uh, yeah, uh, I'm gonna give it a nine. Uh, and I'm gonna, I, I gave it a nine before. I'm gonna give it a nine again because I don't, unlike Colin, I have some consistency. I'm not gonna go and rate. <laughs> I'm not gonna go and play Pokemon Red right now and say this is a shit game by today's standards. Three out of ten. No, I'm gonna just be like. <laughs> That was a game for its time, and like when I was playing it, it was the ten out of tenest game that ever could be possibly in existence. But, anyways, uh, so I guess the closing remark about this game is that, um, yeah, you you, you played Slay the Spire, you're like, oh my god, deck bu building games are great. Then you see Steam has this other deck building game. It's called Inscription. You're like, okay, great. And then you start playing it, and then it gets wild and wacky, like we've all talked about. And that's really, uh, I think it's a uh, uh, 
it's a redefined it's 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 whole, like of all the like so, sort of games that fall into the, the the this kind of category of deck building i won't say roguelike but deck building like it is its own special thing that uh i don't think anyone as far as i know has been able to replicate in any way in an interesting way and i think this is why it's winning awards it's just like the zaniness of what the fuck is happening in this game and like <laughs> you know why there's live action people it's just like it just was full of novelty and surprise, and that's like one of the core things. You, it, it took a ton of development, I think. I, I was at, at the very end. I was not surprised to see the cast of like the creators and everything just like keep scrolling down. Like I knew this was not a solo dev effort, just based on like the complexity of the like the three D animations and all the stuff going into it. So um, lots of content in there, and um, uh, really great uh, for a, a, a playthrough um, for sure. And nothing else really is quite the same. Uh, so yeah, uh, I think transitioning to our segment on similar games is really hard for this one because <laughs> what on nothing earth... else is like it, just like yeah, Will said. Exactly, which is a good. I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw some games out there. They're not Ooh. roguelikes. That is like Stanley Parable, uh, mm -hmm. Gary's Mod, uh, Pony Super... Island is act. Pony Island is a lot like this game. Yeah, is it? Um, Super Liminal uh, is actually a, a recent game that is like you are. You're messing with like the size of objects and you like their perspective changes based off of how like you move around. So it's got a it's got a weird like play on video game stuff is, as well. Is that a Simpsons reference? No. Super, Super liminal. Because I remember that that scene with the Yvonne et Niage, right? Join the uh the no, liminal, it, super it's, subliminal, I mean, it's a play on liminal subliminal. and super liminal. That's yeah. It's subliminal versus super liminal. It's not like uh, below the surface, it's explicitly above the surface. Another another game that if you you know don't mind the genre that kind of scratches the same sort of meta itch is uh, Doki Doki Literature Club, which oh, yeah, is kind of yeah. uh, an mm. arrangement of this sort of thing in like sort of the uh, visual novel Japanese visual novel dating. What's style. the one? What's the one that's like the math or spelling game that gets real weird? Is that math blast? Oh, Frog Fractions. Frog Fractions. Oh, yeah. yeah. Frog Fractions is like super insane. Yeah, I'm pretty yeah, sure that, that is, that is a roguelike at some point. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, with, the point with... is, it's not a roguelike. And no, so yeah. that's why so, we're listing well, all these other games that are roguelikes. Well, so for games, so this was my best attempt at a list of games that are like kind of, kind of, well, that are roguelikes, but still kind of hit that same vibe as Inscription. Um, we talked about Casey's mod uh, as, as its own kind of standalone experience. The Grimora and Magnificus mods, if you are desperate for more inscription type gameplay are, are I guess worth looking into just for that aspect. Um there's a a Japanese manga roguelike like like one bit colored roguelike game called World of Horror, which is very like eldritch uh God, how would you even describe it's again like all these games are kind of like indescribably weird, but hit that kind of horror note very well for Spook Timber coming into Spooktober here. Um, one game that actually like feels very mechanically similar to Inscription is a game that's come out recently called Buckshot Roulette that I don't know if anyone oh, else has yeah. played, but uh, it's like, what if you were playing Russian Roulette with a shotgun and kind of Inscription-y sort of mechanics, question mark. Um, and a similar atmosphere as well, like, you know, first person, you're sitting at a creepy table, low, low lit, spoopiness. <laughs> um, another game that is very... It's it's roguey, but also similarly narrative driven and unsure about replayability. But hard on the narrative aspect is Brutal Orchestra, where you are in purgatory waiting for the guy who killed you to die so you can kill him. Um, there's a Love monster, there. I guess, a monster management game called Lobotomy Corporation. Uh, you have a good, luck. That is a good. That is a good title of a game. <laughs> uh another kind of very eldritchy kind of deal um you have a another like asian inspired or like an asian developer inspired by lovecraftian horror themes like it's like inscription vibe meets luck be a landlord with god i don't know how i've said this before i don't know how to pronounce this fun, fun tang simulator f-h-t-a-g-n simulator uh, you're a demon. You're sacrificing humans and monsters to to raise Cthulhu. Who doesn't like that? Ring of Pain, uh, another kind of horror rogue game that is like a it's like a card based dungeon crawler, which is very interesting. It's um, I'm gonna I'm gonna lump Darkest Dungeon in here too, just for horror theme. 
uh and yeah maybe maybe i'll call it there because we're running a little long in the tooth um yeah similar games it's, it's <laughs> long in the teeth hey that was my we biggest just, problem i wasn't long in the teeth for most of my playthrough get my uh, pliers so that's what you here. put on the scale okay uh, <laughs> uh what are we playing next yeah or well, how well, can well, they reach us yeah Scott? so you know write in with all the stories you have at the dentist where they're pulling out your teeth and putting them on on the scales to to strangle you with grogpodzone at gmail.com mastodon grogpod at game dev.place and grogpod.zone for the website woody you're you're on here to to talk about cool stuff that you're doing this is this is your five minute sequence uh, all right, I seed my time. I'm not doing any cool stuff except for playing Inscription a second time. Okay, that, that was the good. cool thing that I did. Uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, our next episode. Uh, that's nice of you to do that. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank. Oh, always have an open seat here for for whenever. Um, the our next episode is a listener requested episode. This has been one that people have been kicking down our door for a while to talk about. Um, and so we are turning turning the clock back to 1995 and we're booting up our now what do you always call it a snes i've always called it an snes okay. uh and we are booting up mystery dungeon sheeran the wanderer Ooh. which i guess i should i should explain is the japanese only release was for the super nintendo or famicom uh, we're or probably going to play the Nintendo DS version because that way we don't have to worry about weird ROM translation hacks. Um, oh, sure. Yeah. So, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's, uh, it's the remaster from the 1995 version, but anyway, yeah. Mystery dungeon, Sheer in the Wanderer, uh, a, a Japanese, uh, feudal Japan roguelike game. One of the first, uh, to really feature graphics. <laughs> So, so be Exciting on the for developments. That. Yeah, this is uh this is what people have been clamoring for. So thanks, Woody, again for for dropping in as our surprise, quote unquote, secret guest uh sure. for, for act three of the podcast here. Um but uh but playing us out from this episode is uh some tunes to to really underscore the fact that uh, a journey of a thousand sacrificed squirrels begins with the single strum of the banjo.